Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Dutch Test Critique, or as we're, we've uh, nicknamed this, the Dutch Caveats. Uh, my name is Amy Paoletti, and I'm a member of the Dutch Education and Marketing Team, and I'd like to thank everybody for taking time to join us today. Wanted to just go over a few housekeeping items uh, before Mark starts. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we possibly can at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions in the questions section or the chat window of GoToWebinar. And again, it's, it's on your side panel. We'll try to address as many as we can at the end. Um, also wanna let everybody know who's online right now, if you miss anything, uh, we will be sending the on-demand recording along with the presentation slides within the next 24 to 48 hours from today. So let's get to an, a quick introduction here. Uh, many of you probably are already familiar with Mark Newman. Mark is the founder and president of Precision Analytical, the creators of the Dutch test. He is a recognized expert and international speaker in the field of hormone testing. Mark has spent nearly 20 plus years within the specialty laboratory arena, developing and directing 24 hour urine hormone testing, organic acid testing, and salivary hormone testing. His unique experience led to a vision for a revolutionary way to test hormones and thus the inception of the dried urine test for comprehensive hormones, or better known as the Dutch test. So Mark, turning it over to you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, appreciate you guys all joining us today. I've been kind of building up to this for a while. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about competitive advantages and that's normally what we're busy talking about in terms of marketing and messaging um, and so today we want to look at some of the areas where the dutch test might have a weakness or might have an area where it's not the best answer and some of these get a little bit complicated um, and so i just want to kind of unpack some of those things for you so that you can more confidently choose the dutch test when it's the right test choose the serum test or the saliva test when it's the right test um, as well as be able to interpret through some of these issues when maybe maybe just one test on the panel has some sort of caveat which is kind of the, the word i'm using uh, when it comes to this presentation and so we want to go through that today first off though i just want to wish all of you well i know it's been kind of a crazy time and i hope you're all staying safe i know for us it's been super challenging uh, dealing with first the shutdown and COVID and then, you know, for us trying to take our staff and send as many working from home as we can and take our lab staff and we've split them into multiple shifts and uh, opened up weekend shifts to try to just keep our population density as low as we can within the lab so that we're taking that uh, risk of COVID and just lowering it for our own staff while we try to you know, meet your needs. And then, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had the, the forest fires roll through. And we've actually had uh, a handful of staff members who've had family members lose their homes and so we've been, just been a lot to deal with and i know it's been true of a lot of people around the country so just uh, hope you're all doing well and staying safe uh and hope you're ready to get a little bit nerdy today um because we are going to get into some of the nitty-gritty of what we do uh one other announcement i actually wanted to make in, in terms of response to COVID. one of the things that we've found is you know we started dutch it was just this easy thing to collect your samples and drop them in the mailbox. And that's been a really nice solution for us. Now the USPS is having a lot of challenges and it's really stretched out turnaround time a little bit to the point where we've just had to make a change. And so just in terms of taking care of you guys in turnaround time, um, as well as helping with the cost a little bit more uh, in about a week, I think on November 5th, we are ready to announce uh, that our kits will come with return shipping with UPS. So maybe not quite as convenient for some people to be able to just drop it in their mailbox. But yeah. Hey, this, is Amy. this is Amy again. That would be October 5th, not November 5th. What did I say? November 5th? Hey, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> October. Um, hey. Who's keeping track? We're losing track of calendar time around here. Um, but so in just like a week or so, we're going to be starting that with UPS return shipping. So your patients will be able to just take the samples, take them to UPS, uh, a little bit more steady in terms of being able to expect when we're going to get the samples um, so that we can get you those results in a timely fashion. All right. I'm going to kill my camera so you can see my full screen and we will uh, get started here. Okay. So 
we like to think of things in life as certain. We certainly like to think of our lab tests that they're, you know, they're sophisticated and uh, we like to think of them as being certain. But with all lab tests, there is some uncertainty and we want to be able to to make sure we're dealing with that appropriately. And even when the lab test gets it right, there still is some uncertainty in terms of what's going on with the patient. I just kind of grabbed a random study where they were looking at blood testing. So not a direct parallel to what we're doing. And they were looking at errors and they found that mistakes made before the samples even tested was about 70% of the, of the lab error. So you're in this case, you're talking about blood draw errors or people ordering the wrong tests. Um, but certainly in the in the world of urine testing, you know, patients can collect samples wrong. They can collect them at the wrong time, the wrong type type of the of the the cycle. And we deal with that with our patients. Um, that creates some uncertainty in some certain situations. And today we want to talk about the uncertainties that relate specifically to the Dutch test. Now, for all of its strengths, um, and if we want to just highlight those. A little bit. The Dutch test, of course, the comprehensiveness is what people really love about the Dutch test. You know, functional medicine used to be, you know, maybe a serum test and maybe you do your salivary cortisol. And then we've kind of evolved to the car, which we've included with our Dutch Plus. And we've been able to provide a lot more information with the Dutch test. Now, I'll just pause right here and give you caveat number one while I'm looking at this list. Sometimes this catches people up a little bit and they think my patient doesn't make much estrogen, but you know, he or she is, we know, exposed to bisphenol A and all these environmental estrogens. Just keep in mind, we're measuring very exact hormones, right? So we're testing estradiol, not xenoestrogen. So if you're looking for estrogen exposure, that's not an endogenous, uh, a, a, a hormone that your body makes, those are things we're not gonna see on the Dutch panel. But getting back to the Dutch strengths, it's comprehensive, it's easy to do, it's a good representation of a 24-hour period, uh, and I think probably the best overall HRT monitoring tool. But where are there some issues that you need to be aware of? And this is where, you know, my, my wife jokes about the lab being our fourth unplanned child, um, and just using a parallel with a child, if I introduced you to my children and even people who know them fairly well, like they're wonderful kids um, and I love them dearly, uh, but people who know them only peripherally really don't know the things they struggle with the most, right? You ask their mom or dad when we, we see them at all their moments, uh, we could well articulate uh, the things that they're terrific at and the things that they're struggling or working on. And I think uh, the Dutch test for me is, is um, I look at that way, it's a creation of mine and I'm in the best position really to lay out for you the areas where there, where there is some uncertainty and we wanna do that today. And one of the reasons we wanna do that is this is a picture from our lunchroom wall that shows our core values as a company. We, we wanna take care of our people. Um, and number two on there is we will be transparent and it says we believe honest humility should characterize the way we, we, we interact and communicate with our team and the way we represent our product in the marketplace. So this is uh, an effort from us to just be transparent with the people who use our test to make sure that they know it as well as they can. Again, to increase both your competence and your confidence in using the Dutch test. So I'm gonna give you three areas where I see that you need to be aware of some potential issues as you navigate the Dutch test. One is just typical lab uncertainty. So as a lab guy, that's gonna be short because those are specific to the Dutch test. I'll just hit on that briefly and then we'll get back to these other two. So let's talk about just general lab uncertainty. Now, if you're gonna do a hemoglobin A1C, that happens to be a blood test that is internationally standardized. It's really, really easy lab test. So the precision on those things are like amazing, right? So if your hemoglobin A1C is six and then it goes to 6.1, that's a significant change, right? With most esoteric lab tests like the Dutch test, I think we've built our test as well as anyone who's doing those types of tests. But with those types of uh, tests that require a lot of sample preparation, manipulation, uh, sophisticated instrumentation. It's pretty good idea to just assume that your numbers are about plus or minus five or 10%. So if I'm looking at 
uh, 2-hydroxyestrogen, 2-methoxyestrogen, you know, this 2-methoxyestrogen, this two -methoxyestrogen, you know, it's 5.5. Could be 6, could be 5, plus or minus 10% is a good way to think about that. Same thing with the 2-hydroxyestrogen. So as I look at this, that tolerance puts the 2-hydroxyestrogen well within the luteal range, the 2-methoxy well within the luteal range, but decidedly higher than the 2-hydroxy, which means the methylation's going pretty well, right? Within that plus or minus 2%, I can tell you some, some pretty confident things here. The levels are normal in the luteal phase. Methylation is going reasonably well for this patient. Now, at low concentrations, you're going to want to expand your view of that, right? And that's whether this is any, any lab test like this, an organic acid test or, you know, whatever it might be. That's a quantitative test. So if I look at the patient on the bottom here, I can see that 2-methoxy-E1 is 0 0.1. Now that's going to have a lot more tolerance. Why? Because it's really close to the detection limit of the assay. So that number could be 0 0.2. The 2-hydroxy-E1 is listed as 0 0.4. That could just as easily be 0 0.3. So there's a little bit more tolerance there. So I know confidently that this patient has very low levels of these estrogen metabolites. But when I start evaluating a ratio of saying, how well are you turning one metabolite into the other and saying, oh, wow, you're a low methylator. I want to relax my conclusion on that a little bit, knowing that it's such a very low concentration and look at that as a little bit more of an approximate conclusion because I know that there's a little bit more variability when it comes to laboratory tests at a very, very challenging concentration. So if I'm looking at phase one estrogen metabolism, and this is um, a look of our new report format that'll be out in the new year. Um, so it looks a little different than what you're used to possibly. But I can see here, you know, you're making a lot of 4-hydroxyestrogens, 2-hydroxy. I'm going to look at these ratios and say, well, 18, 20% on the 4-hydroxy is higher than it should be. And so it's pretty obvious, right, that they're making a lot of 4-hydroxyestrogens. And I want to evaluate that and I want to act in light of that. But when I look at someone who has these very low levels, on our new report, it's actually gonna pull out this pie chart that's not there on this one because those levels are so low that we want you to look at those as more approximate and not make too much of the ratios when you're at those very low challenging concentrations. So just keep that in mind. That's, that's just a general uh, thing to be aware of when you're looking at laboratory uh, testing. So if you're looking at uh, any hormone in saliva, urine, whatever, when you get down really low levels, don't put quite as much weight in those ratios uh, or the absolute numbers because they're going to be a little, a little bouncy um, on the low end. Okay, so the, let's get into then the main two categories that I really want to touch on today. Spot urine uncertainty and the uncertainty of using a waste product. So we'll get to the second one in a minute, but let's talk about what it means to use spot urine. So what a lot of people will say is, boy, I don't, I don't know about that dried urine. You know, is that, is that valid? I'll tell you, using a dried sample is a piece of cake. The correlation between liquid and dried is really, really good, right? So the, it's not the dried that is much of an issue that we need to work through. It's the fact that it's not a 24 hour urine sample. It's a spot urine sample. And there's some uncertainty with that that we need to be aware of. So before we dig into that, let's just make sure we're clear on how urine testing works. Okay, so in systemic circulation, you have hormones. They're mostly bound to protein, right? So uh, like SHBG. So when the ovary makes, let's say estradiol or progesterone, it's gonna bind to protein and that's what you're gonna find in serum, right? So only about 2% of the hormone is free. Most of it's bound to SHBG or cortisol binding globulin in the case of progesterone. And when I draw blood out of a vein, that's mostly what I'm looking at is that total hormone that's bound to the protein, right? The free hormone that's a tiny little fraction of the hormone, that's what's going to end up in saliva and I can measure that. So if, let's say I'm talking about estradiol. So when you make estradiol and you have free estradiol, that's floating around in circulation. Can that free estradiol get its way into urine? No, it's not water soluble enough to find its way into urine. So it's gonna go to the liver. The liver is gonna say, I'm gonna make this more water soluble. I'm gonna add 
a glucuronide or a sulfite sulfate group to that hormone it's going to circulate briefly in most cases as this conjugated hormone and then find its way into urine now you notice you can't have that happen if you're still bound to the binding protein so in that sense urine becomes a nice reflection of bioavailable hormone but it's not free hormone but it's not total hormone it's a conjugated hormone right it's a really nice measurement that's a reflection of bioavailable hormone but it's a different measurement than what you'd measure in saliva or in serum right so protein bound free hormone and then a hormone conjugate the exception to this is cortisol Cortisol is very polar compared to the other hormones. It's more water soluble. So you actually find it in urine, just like you do in saliva, right? It's free cortisol that we want to measure in urine. Everything else, even cortisol metabolites, uh, sex hormones, androgens, all of those are found as hormone conjugates in urine. Okay. So, so what do we mean by spot urine sample? Okay. We're talking about the issue here is creatinine dependence. So let's look at serum and saliva and urine, just in terms of their general limitations. What, what are the big weaknesses of serum or saliva? Is look at this progesterone. This is progesterone and serum of a woman throughout the day. It's bouncing between about six and 36. It's pretty variable, right? That's one weakness of serum and saliva is moment to moment variability. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have an average over these large chunks of time? Those four red circles approximately represent the time periods that the Dutch test represents. So either a 24-hour urine or a Dutch test does a much better job of averaging that out. So if we move to a 24-hour urine, we've reduced one of the limitations that serum or saliva testing has. But like every test, it has its own limitations. Many patients, when they're trying to collect a 24-hour urine, might miss a collection. You might not know that as a provider, and that number is going to be compromised, right? One of the things you don't think about much with a 24-hour urine is if you take a jug and fill it full of a liquid, uh, whether it's urine or otherwise, and you just have non-scientists measure it, that's the first lab measurement of a 24-hour urine sample, right? A man or woman at home collects, and they might have 1.35 liters of urine. When they go to measure it as a person who's not used to making those types of measurements, uh, I did a little experiment once and found that about 20% error was actually pretty common. And that's built right into your lab test because they're gonna pour off a little bit, they're gonna record their volume and send it into the lab, right? So there's some uncertainty there about the collection and the measurement for 24-hour urine. Those two things are not an issue with the Dutch test. Well, what is? Creatinine correction. Using creatinine to correct for hydration is the issue we have to wrestle with. So each of these tests has its own limitations, its own drawbacks, and I don't, I don't think any one of those uh, is is necessarily um, significantly worse than the other. They all just have their sort of caveats that you need to work within. So let's talk about ours. Creatinine excretion is used to correct for hydration. So let me explain this. So. If I provided urine sample number one on Monday and I'm not very hydrated, and then on Tuesday, my hormone status is exactly the same, theoretically, but I drink more water, what happens? The urine sample has a lighter color, it has the same amount of hormone, the same amount of creatinine in it, right? Whereas if this second person produces a urine sample, and C represents creatinine here, and then the little H is the hormone, this second person, if you look at the ratio between hormone to creatinine has less, right? So that's what we're doing is in these, we're taking one chunk of the urine in a spot urine sample, and we're looking at the ratio between the hormone and creatinine because creatinine is excreted at a predictable rate, right? So we're gonna put that in a urine jug or container. In our case, it's a dried sample. And then the lab is going to measure that. Right now, what happens in a 24-hour urine? Over time of the day, creatinine and hormone enter into the urine, right? So now I have an entire day with an entire collection of both creatinine and the hormone. I'm, for a 24-hour urine, I'm just measuring the hormone, right? And I'm gonna tell you how much you have in a 24-hour urine sample. So if this is my day one and I'm hydrated, on day two, when I'm dehydrated, it should look something like this, the same amount of hormone in that 24 hours, and that's what the urine test is reporting. Now, for the Dutch test, what we said is, well, what if we take a dried sample from here, from here, from here, and from here, 
and we combine those so we take a weighted average of those four samples and we report it compared to creatinine which is the way you just is commonly done for spot urine samples and we compare that to a 24-hour value and what we found is that we were able to get really good data in terms of correlation between the those four samples the dutch samples and a 24-hour this happens to be testosterone data that we're uh, in the process of publishing right now. Cortisol might look something like this if you if you picture this as the day, right? In the early morning, you're going to get this big wave of cortisol. And so we said, well, what if, if we time those samples just right? Can we get the same diurnal pattern? So you can see here's a urine sample, even color coded in yellow for you. And the other is saliva. And when we look at the statistically, at, this is from 68 people who collected both samples on the same day. And you can look at the salivary results that bounce up in the first half hour. And that's that cortisol awakening response we love to look at in saliva. But this diurnal pattern in saliva and urine look very similar. So what we were able to do in validation is we got excellent agreement between liquid and dry. We found that the four spot sample was reflective of a 24 hour urine collection and it displayed the diurnal pattern of cortisol commonly seen with, seen with saliva. Dry and urine, dried urine measures of total free cortisol and peak cortisol were consistent with what we saw in saliva. So now we have a method where we can look at a 24 hour urine equivalent. This was the, the, the vision of Dutch is can we look at the cortisol pattern and all of this other, other information at the same time. This has actually been submitted for uh, publication um, and we're, we're waiting to actually get that in print, which is pretty exciting. So what do we need to be careful of when we're looking at cortisol in urine? Well, there are a few caveats with that. One, you don't wanna use urine for cortisol if the patient has a kidney issue, right? Atypical GFR means an atypical urine cortisol excretion. You don't wanna do that. In those cases, you definitely wanna use the Dutch Plus where we're getting metabolites and all of that other stuff from the urine. But in that case, we're getting the free cortisol pattern from saliva. Now, if creatinine is very low or high, the individual results may be less certain. So here's a caveat you need to know for using the Dutch Complete, for using the cortisol pattern out of a urine sample. Let me show you an example. This is kind of a worst case scenario. So here's the creatinine. So we have four um, samples, right, taken throughout the day. And what you'll notice is that one creatinine is above two and one creatinine is below 0.1. So what we would say is that the creatinine as, so obviously the, the, that, this sample in the early morning is very dilute, meaning they, they had a lot of fluids during that time, whereas going into bedtime, they were relatively dehydrated. And what our validation data shows is that as you get more hydrated, the creatinine does a really nice job of correcting for the hormone concentration because again, creatinine is excreted at a predictable, um, at a predictable rate, but that has limits. Right. So as we get down around 0 0.1, we say, gosh, that's getting pretty low. So creatinine's ability to correct for hydration is getting stretched a little bit here. So let me show you what we got for this patient. So we take all four samples. They're all used to measure the metabolites of cortisol. Those are low. OK, we look at the cortisol pattern. We're low here and we're low here. Right. We look at cortisone, which is just the inactive form of cortisol. It kind of gives you a secondary look at that cortisol pattern and everything's low over here. And what you notice is only one measurement is not low. Well, that is a pattern that some people have, that the cortisol bounces up in the morning. And the reason that this patient's cortisol potentially bounces up is because you're getting more of a preference for cortisol and you're not getting a lot of that deactivation to cortisone throughout the day. That's a, a pattern you might see, except with this patient, what we know is that one result that looks different than the rest that implies higher cortisol production is really stretching creatinine's ability to correct for hydration. And so what we would say is there's less certainty with that value. You can see this is taken straight from a report. This, this uh, comment here in red 
is on the report for that very reason, to say there's a very low creatinine value here, which happens to be the second sample. And for these individual measurements, they may be less reliable. So as I look at this as a whole picture, I say everything is pointing towards low cortisol production with the exception of one measurement that's coming from a sample that's very, very dilute. And so we wanna be a little bit more cautious with our interpretation there. So ideally, all of the creatinine values would fall within the normal range of hydration. And then it's gonna do a really, really solid job of giving you a cortisol pattern that's gonna parallel what you see in saliva. Again, in this case, we wanna be a little bit cautious with that conclusion. Okay, so creatinine correction, we validated this, right? It works really well comparing to 24 hours, but we had to work at it a little bit because there's an issue here that, so I'm, I'm gonna explain two issues. One of the issues we've fixed, I think uh, using some creativity and research, and the second problem potentially is a remaining caveat when using the Dutch model. So let's say we have an individual named Mark who's gonna provide a urine sample, okay? And we have a second individual named Clark who's gonna provide also a urine sample. You say, okay, these two guys are really different sizes, right? We've got your, your Rayleigh scrawny guy and you've got a guy who's a little bit beefier, okay? So let's say we're gonna look at a hormone that has nothing to do with their size. I don't wanna think about testosterone and hey, maybe guy number two has more testosterone because he's a big muscular guy. Let's, let's think about something that's not even related really to male hormones that much. Let's think about progesterone metabolites, right? We don't pay that much attention to them in men. We look at the progesterone metabolite of person number one, and he's got, we're gonna look at four. And person number two, I'm gonna tell you that his hormone status as it relates to progesterone is the same. So, so in a 24 hour urine, also four, right? Same, okay. But now we're saying, what we, if we wanna look at a spot urine, we're gonna look at it relative to creatinine, right? So we'll measure creatinine. And in this case, we can see the ratio of hormone to creatinine. So for my example, it's four to two, right? So that's a four to two ratio. And if I look over here, and this was also four to two, we say, oh, the, well, they're the same, but guess what? If you're, if you're a much bigger guy with a lot more muscle mass, what are you gonna have? Well, you're gonna have more creatinine in your urine, right? We know that creatinine is excreted and has a relationship to basically your size, right? So, so height, weight, and age. So when we do the math here, as a spot urine reported hormone per creatinine, A is higher than B, and that's wrong. Right, in that sense, we've introduced a bias in the test, right? We say, okay, if that bias exists in the test and we know that creatinine excretion differs quite a bit based on age, height, and weight, well, how in the world then did you get such nice 24-hour correlation? Well, we corrected for that, right? Creatinine corrects for hydration, but it is dependent on age, height, and weight. It brings significant bias into spot urine testing but there's a fix to this problem, which is how we got such nice data, is that there's a really nice study where they looked at thousands and thousands of 24-hour urine samples for people of all different ages, heights, and weights, and even races. And they were able to uh, produce relationships that can be used to predict the difference in creatinine excretion that's expected between people of different sizes essentially and we were able to use that data to take this type of data that would have just been let's call it modest correlation to a 24-hour urine and you'd say okay it's not a great replacement for a 24-hour urine but it's okay right and we were able to transform it from that into the excellent correlation that you see here and that we're working on publishing okay so bias due to person-to-person -person variability if you want to call it that we fixed that. And I'm not aware of any other lab that's doing spot urine analysis that's gone to the detail of figuring out those relationships and correcting for that. But it helps. And that's something that we do that's unique to us. Uh, and that's why I think there's really an advantage to us that this is such a focus of ours, right? We don't do all these different lab tests and then also do the Dutch test. Like this is our focus because it's complicated, right? But there's still one remaining. Okay. What if for a reason that's unknown to me or to you, the person doesn't excrete the amount of creatinine that they're quote, supposed to, right? So if you think of 
this sample again, where, where you have hormone and you have creatinine and it correlates to 24 hour urine and we're all happy, right? What if that patient for a reason that we're not aware of has extra creatinine in their urine? So the hormone, it's gonna be hormone, right, per creatinine. Sorry, it's a little sloppy. So if I add more creatinine, what's it gonna do? It's gonna drag that number down in the way that we're reporting it. Or if someone's not excreting as much creatinine as they're supposed to, not because of hydration, but just because of their normal physiology. Now, these are these are very robust relationships. But again, if you test a thousand people, you know, somebody's gonna be off a little bit on their creatinine excretion, right? When you look at their 24 hour total excretion of creatinine, and particularly if they have a kidney issue, this is one of the reasons why we say you might want to use another test entirely. Or for confirmation, if you have kidney issues that might um, also impact your creatinine. But that wouldn't, and this is important to know, this will impact the entire profile, right? So if you think about this as a summary, right, what do we say about this patient? Well, estradiol is high, progesterone is low normal, right? So this is where we look at estrogen dominance and we say, okay, the estrogen's clear up in this neck of the woods, so we're, we're looking at an estrogen dominant patient here. Even though the progesterone's normal, it's low, right? And testosterone's almost elevated, DHA is almost elevated, free cortisol total is almost elevated, and this one right here is almost elevated, right? So if I look at the ones that are almost high, this is how close they are to being elevated, right? So if the creatinine was off, if you will, by 20% in this case, which it rarely is, right? But if it was, it would drive those numbers up. Now the testosterone's out of range high. The DHEA is out of range high, right? Uh, the, this morning cortisol point would poke out of the range elevated. So if we have a situation where the patient's not excreting creatinine in the way that they're supposed to, we don't have a window into that, right? As creatinine gets lower and higher, we're assuming that that's just due to hydration. If they actually have a physiological reason for excreting abnormal amounts of creatinine for themselves, then that's gonna drag all of these results with it. Again, that's why it's so important for us to do validation data to say in most cases, right, we can show precision and accuracy, that's published. 24 hour correlation, published. Serum correlation, published for estradiol and progesterone. And then saliva correlation is publication pending, right? So this is an area, probably the biggest area with spot urine testing. There's a lot of spot urine testing out there on the market. Um, again, we've done more to remove the bias that can exist with that model, but this is where it still sits, right? And again, this is not unique to our testing. If you do a 24 hour urine test, you have some uncertainty if the patient collected 24 hours correctly if they measured their sample correctly. With serum and saliva, you have to worry if your patient had a flare up of a particular hormone that just lasted for you know, a few minutes, as hormones are, are released in a pulsatile type manner, that's the uncertainty there. And again, this, while very reliable, is an area where with Dutch, we need to think about that when we see results that might not match the clinical picture. Okay, so I hope that was helpful for Issue number one of, of two that we really want to dig into today. Spot urine has some uncertainty with it. If you understand that, it's helpful as you enter into the Dutch test and using uh, the Dutch test in your practice. Okay, that's issue number one. Issue number two that we want to go through is, this is what I would hear from someone. Uh, urine's a waste product. Like, does that work? And then we would say, well, look at our validation data. It works really well, right? Uh, but there are some caveats to the fact that we're measuring a conjugated hormone in the urine that we need to be aware of to use this test well, okay? Now, before we get into the specifics of that, part of the limitations of using a waste product have to do with HRT and when Dutch might not be the best answer for HRT. So let's just touch on that briefly before we head into the, the weeds um, on this last issue. OK, this is my matrix that I've spent, you know, a decade kind of putting together and really studying the literature to say, OK, when 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 do we like urine testing more? Maybe more importantly, when do we not like urine testing? Um, you know, we don't like serum or urine feedback on transdermal progesterone. 
that's a totally different topic for another day. Love to talk about it. Um, but it's important to know that we don't feel like the feedback you get from transdermal progesterone when you're testing urine is super meaningful for impacting, is this the right dose, okay? Same thing with vaginal hormones with progesterone. That gets a little bit complicated, um, but the urine metabolite that we measured gets made at lower uh, levels in a relative sense compared to other situations when you take it vaginally. The other issue with that is if you take it vaginally, you get all this uterine first pass. What does that mean? Progesterone goes in the upper third of the vaginal space, and there's a, there's a special blood flow right from there to the uterus. No lab test speaks for that, right? The uterus, which you're trying to get progesterone to, gets loaded up with progesterone at levels that no lab test is gonna speak for. So we wanna be careful with our interpretation in that situation. But lastly, you're not gonna be able to change your dose of an oral estrogen, which I'm not a big fan of oral estrogen, but if someone's on it, don't use a urine test to tweak the dose. With sublingual hormone of any sort, you don't wanna use urine. Okay, why? Let me show you just a particular patient's example. She's on sublingual estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And look at that, her results are high. What does that mean? It means nothing. Okay, well, we did it again. This time she skipped the dose for one to two days. What does that mean? Let me, let me show you why this is a problem. Okay, the, the thing in the middle here just represents, just call that the gut, okay? That represents the gut. Okay, so I take HRT orally. It's gonna enter the gut. Okay, what am I trying to do? Let's say it's estradiol. Okay, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm thinking to myself, some of the estradiol is gonna escape from the gut, right? As estradiol, it's free to do its work. Some of it ends up bound to a binding protein, you'll end up in serum, that's a good measurement. Some of it's free and it's gonna end up in saliva. Uh, there's possibility for that to work well. Okay, in urine, remember, it's conjugate. Okay, so it hits the liver, gets conjugated, finds its way into urine. Those measurements, any of those three measurements would work. What's the problem? Look in your gut, still got lots of estrogen. Okay, so some of it gets turned into metabolites. So now in the gut, I have estrogen, I have estrogen metabolites. In the gut, they get conjugated. Has any of that hormone gotten to a receptor? No. Then what happens? They circulate as conjugate. This is first pass metabolism, right? You've heard that term, first pass. What happens? The urine is flooded with hormone conjugates that look just like the hormone that we want to measure, right? That's what it is, estradiol glucuronide, right? In the urine, you're going to get an over-representation of what's going on. You can't differentiate. It's not a useful test for, mo for monitoring dosing. Okay, so with sublingual, this is a sublingual example, but you can apply it to oral as well for estrogen and testosterone. Now, high results don't mean you have too much hormone. Normal results don't mean you got it right. It's not a useful tool in those situations. Okay, so now you will notice on the left, I'm saying that urine testing actually does work for oral progesterone. Now, this is a lecture about when Dutch doesn't work very well. So I don't want to go into this in detail, but I don't want to confuse you at the same time. Serum testing and saliva testing do not work for oral progesterone. You take it at bedtime, the results go up and down while you're sleeping, you wake up, you get a number, that number is not worth paying attention to, okay? But in urine, what are we looking at? In urine, well, let me just, let me just state this first as one more caveat. We have correlated progesterone, right? Serum to urine metabolites. From that, we're able to give you, to make us a little bit easier interpretation, a serum equivalent of progesterone, right? We don't measure progesterone because it's not in urine. It's unique in that progesterone has to get turned into a metabolite called pregnant dial, and you measure those conjugates in the urine, right? From that, we can calculate a serum equivalent just to help you kind of understand where you're at with progesterone production. This is not a legitimate concept when you're on progesterone therapy, okay? In our new reporting format out next year, this will actually be taken off when you're on uh, progesterone therapy orally or sublingually because it doesn't work for predicting systemic progesterone levels, right? But it does work to give you feedback that's very useful with oral progesterone. What do we know about oral progesterone? We know that you make alpha metabolites that help you sleep, and you make more inert beta metabolites, right? So if you look at these two women, one of them pushes heavily down the alpha pathway. One of them pushes more heavily down the more inert beta pathway. So let's say neither of them were sleeping well, and that's part of why you're giving them progesterone. 
then this patient down here, don't give her more progesterone, right? Because she's already making lots of those metabolites, right? You might want to look at her melatonin and cortisol, other reasons that her sleep might not be doing very well. Whereas this woman uh, up above, she's not making as much of that sleepy hormone family as is normal. And maybe she'll need a little bit of a higher dose, right? So that's how this is used to leverage information with oral progesterone, which I think is useful information. Okay. So this concept of progesterone serum equivalent, you don't want to pay attention to that when they're on oral progesterone therapy. You just want to look at how they're metabolizing it. How are they breaking it down? Is the gut pushing it down that active pathway or not? That's the only question we're trying to answer. And it is helpful in evaluating doses. Okay, so that's an H, a really brief HRT summary of where Dutch succeeds, uh, but especially where Dutch is a struggle. Oral and sublingual hormones, aside from progesterone orally, it's not all that useful, okay? Now, lastly, phase two metabolism, as, as we've said, is assumed to work well when we're using a urine test. Now, testosterone, and this is my last big point, and we're going to dig into this. Testosterone has some known issues that may limit utility in urine. The more comprehensive panels that we do make proper interpretation more likely, but it's still a challenge, and that's what I want to talk about, to make sure that we're all up to speed on this limitation of urine testing. Urine testing presupposes normal phase two. With most hormones, this is true, right? We've published this. Serum and urine, estrogen, progesterone right? What did it say? For estradiol and progesterone, this dried urine assay is a good surrogate for serum testing, right? It works well, right? But testosterone, glucuronidation, that's the phase two, doesn't always happen normally. Okay, so let's remind ourselves, in the liver, you have the hormone, and it's getting this water-soluble group, the, the glucuronide, added before it finds its way into urine. Well, what if that enzyme's broken? Good question. Okay, testosterone glucuronidation, right? Adding this little sugar moiety doesn't always happen normally. Look at this data. Okay, people of Asian descent, when we look at testosterone glucuronide in urine, most of them are down here, down here. But then when we look at Caucasian people, most of them are up here. What? Like, why would there be a difference? Are you telling me that Caucasian people have more testosterone production? than people of Asian descent? No, right? Here's their range in blood. Asian ethnic group, Caucasian ethnic group. It's the same, right? It's very similar. But then when you look at it in urine, look how different it is. Why? Because there's a genetic variant that is super prevalent in Southeastern Asian um, ethnicity right? More than 60% have what's called this UGT defect. It's, it's a deletion, right? Less than 10% of other ethnicities have it, right? It's caused by a gene deletion. There are no physiological consequences, right? Because your testosterone that's floating around is, is fine. It just has to find a different pathway to find its way into urine. So it's a, it's a weirdness as to how it's represented in urine and it's underrepresented. Here's a nice study. If you want to look at that study, it'll kind of walk you through all the gory details of this. But for us, it just means this test, need, you need to be really careful with certain populations. So this is our little steroid pathway, right? So you can see the, the hormones that are encapsulated in blue there, like testosterone, those are ones we measure. The ones with a red circle around them are glucuronidated by the same enzyme. So if you have the variant testosterone, 5-alpha DHT and 5-beta androstane diol, are going to be artificially low, whereas 5-alpha androstane diol and epitestosterone, right, should be fine. So what does it look like? So we call this the UGT defect. A variant would probably be a better word for it. So it's a genetic variant, okay? Testosterone, DHT, 5-beta androstane diol, low, right? And look at the epitestosterone, much higher, right? So if you see a case where epitestosterone is much higher than testosterone. They're usually uh, around the same concentration. When it's higher, then there's reason to be a little bit suspicious of a urine test, and especially if they're of Asian descent, okay? So what does it look like? Testosterone is falsely low in urine, 
epitestosterone and 5-alpha androstenediol are right, so to speak, and DHT and 5-beta androstenediol also falsely low. Why? Again, it's a different enzyme that conjugates those, those two groups that I'm splitting those into. Okay, so if I was just to say, well, what are the pros and cons of urine testing? Well, urine testing is a better average over time than serum or saliva. That's true, even for testosterone, right? GCMS or LCMS is really accurate, right? We're getting a good analytical number, true. And it reflects bioavailable hormone, also true. But only if phase two metabolism is appropriate, it's assuming phase two metabolism is appropriate. And that is a drawback, again, particularly for estradiol, most of the other hormones that we have looked at um, are just fine. Okay, so what? Like, what do I do with this information? Okay, well, let's break this down. Not on TRT or on TRT. If you're not, if you don't have someone on testosterone replacement, what am I thinking? I'm thinking that testosterone or urine is maybe more of a uh, secondary test for testosterone and serum would be more primary. So particularly if I'm looking at men, and I wanna think, do they need TRT? I really want a serum measurement as well, right? And that's not true of Dutch, it's true of any urine measurement of testosterone. Urine's not reliable for patient, patients of Asian descent for testosterone because it's so prevalent, right? When epitestosterone is higher than testosterone, be suspicious. If DHT and 5-beta androstenediol are also low, be even more suspicious, right? Confirm low testosterone with serum before TRT for sure. Okay, so that's patients not on TRT. Well, what if they are? Well, still, urine is a useful secondary test. I mean, think about the Dutch test on TRT. You're getting estrogen, you're getting estrogen metabolites, you're getting glutathione deficiency marker, B12 marker. I mean, what if they're what if their um, sexual side effects are related to stress? Well, gee, isn't it nice to have a test that also includes all of this stuff related to cortisol. Yeah, there's some great information there, but the testosterone needs to be secondary, okay? Again, not reliable if you're of Asian descent. And remember, if someone has this UGT variant and they're low, and then you throw them on too much testosterone, their urine result will still be low, right? So here's the other thing that epitestosterone is interesting for. It acts as a surrogate for approximate testicular production of testosterone. And this I think is, as a nerdy chemist guy, like this is fun in terms of digging through the data and having this other interesting marker for these different cases when we're monitoring TRT. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so I'm saying that <clears throat> urine testing works for transdermal testosterone. It's gonna work for injections, but you're probably also wanting, especially in men with testosterone, you're also wanting serum. Okay, now, epitestosterone is also made by the testes, but it's not androgenic. So if you're a baseball fan, think of epitestosterone as Ozzy Canseco. If you're not a baseball fan, Jose Canseco uh, was a great home run hitter back in the 80s and the 90s, right? He has a twin brother that looks exactly like him that was not so good at hitting home runs. He didn't have the power, didn't have the strength, he didn't have the androgenic impact of Jose Canseco, who probably would have been a Hall of Famer if he didn't uh, cheat and juice up on steroids, although who knows where his career would have gone had he not juiced up on steroids. But Ozzy Canseco was sort of like the, as it relates to baseball, the, the impotent twin, right? And that's what testosterone, epitestosterone is. Looks almost the same, right? There's the difference, right? The, is the OH pointing up or down? That's the epimer. It's not androgenic but it's made by the testes in similar concentrations. So it looks very much like testosterone in terms of what you're gonna find on a urine panel, right? So it's made by the testes, remember. So that makes it a marker of approximate testicular androgen production. Well, why is that useful? Well, before TRT, it should be similar to testosterone. Okay, so let's say this is a typical aging male. Testosterone's around 40. So this is again from our new reporting, but you can see here's the age range built right into the report dial. That's the average for over 60. So 40 is kind of right in the middle of that, right? Same with epitestosterone, okay? Now, with TRT, epitestosterone will go down to the extent that LH and gonadal androgen production is suppressed, which is useful addi additional information. So maybe this is your typical TRT candidate, 
right? The average aging male, maybe some of you want to put him on testosterone. I'm not here to tell you that. But the guy on the right, he's definitely a candidate for TRT, right? He's below the whole range, below the age range, not a lot of testosterone, and epitestosterone goes with it. Okay, so let's take that patient and put him on 25 milligrams of transdermal testosterone gel. What happens? Well, testosterone is going to go up. Now, this data I'm about to show you, all, everything I'm about to show you is aggregate data from our database. So this is from a couple hundred guys taking 25 milligrams. Epitestosterone is still hanging in here, which means the testes are still making testosterone. And that's your hint, right? Now, look, 100 milligrams, it's going to go up a little higher, and the epi starts to wane, right? Now, look what happens when we put them on 200. Boom. We break its back. What does this mean? That means LH suppression has happened. And when epitestosterone is below 10, and especially below 5, call that gonadal suppression. If you find that interesting and useful in your testing, and you can see the testosterone is continuing to go up, right? That's helpful. Now, look at the testosterone again. I want you to remember the numbers, 76 and 4. Now, let's compare to an injection. Three days after an injection, the average man is much higher then with the 200 milligram gel and look at epitestosterone, right? Down. Five days after injection, the testosterone's coming down. 10 days after injection, you're probably ready for your next injection. So testosterone has dropped quite a bit, but guess what? Gonadal suppression is still induced, right? And that's your clue that this 45 here, right? Tells you there's still testosterone on board from the injection. That makes sense? because the epitestosterone is gonadal. The testosterone is gonadal plus the supplement, right? So let's look at pellets. There's 12 to 24 weeks after a pellet, you're getting a pretty high, and this is all kinds of different doses and stuff. This is just from our database. But look what it does to your LH or your epitestosterone. Now, two to 12 weeks, so after the pellet insertion, you're getting, on average, much higher testosterone levels. Now, I'm not here to tell you today what dose I think you should take. I'm just here to tell you that this epitestosterone for today is interesting when you're on TRT uh, because it's helpful. So what is it useful for? Epitestosterone. So it's, a, it's a, just a nifty tool that you get with urine testing, helps you identify the UGT variant, right? And it approximate gonadal androgen production for those that have the UGT variant, which have falsely low urine, and for TRT patients. I find that useful. Okay, so that is the list as I see them of significant things that need to be known for those that really want to leverage the Dutch test. We know that it's based off a model of creatinine dependence. We know that carries with it some uncertainty. And again, it's a, it's a solid assay, right? It's a solid concept, but that's where our uncertainty comes from. There are some HRT scenarios where it's not a good idea. And then we've got, in terms of, uh, if you wanna impact um, the dose, to get the dose right, right? And then you've got your phase two metabolism assumed, which we just went through in some detail. Okay, so where does that leave me? When do I not even wanna use the Dutch test? I wanna think about abandoning the Dutch test for people with kidney issues. Okay. Now, if you wanted me to go into some detail about, well, how would you use it with someone with a kidney issue? Well, I'm gonna say, look, the cortisol is a total crapshoot. Like, I, I don't want to pay attention to cortisol with the kidney. But if the kidney impacts creatinine, then my all of my results could be inaccurate. But your hormone metabolite ratios would still be intact, meaning whether you prefer the 2 to the 4 to the 16 hydroxy, whether you're methylating well, the ratios would be intact. So you'll still get some useful information. Am I aromatizing androgens into estrogens? How's my relative dominance of estrogen compared to progesterone? You could still get some really good information out of that. But when you say, am I elevated or not? Am I low or not for a particular hormone? There's going to be more uncertainty for those patients. Okay, if you're of Asian descent, the patient, and focusing on testosterone or TRT, I probably wouldn't use Dutch. Too likely to mislead, okay? If you wanna monitor oral estrogen, sublingual hormones, uh, if anyone was on oral testosterone, which generally isn't thought to be a good idea, not a good idea to base your clinical decisions on that. So those are the three big ones when not to use. Another one I would just say is if you've got a pellet of testosterone and all you want, and, and you've got budget constraints, and all I want is testosterone, 
just use a serum test, right? That's the Dutch is probably overkill if you just want that one value. So that might be another situation where you say, you know what, I'm just going to use a serum test. Okay, that's when not to use. Well, when do we just need to be careful with the interpretation? Okay, when the urine testosterone is low and the epi testosterone is higher. Okay, now let me stop on that for a second because one thing I didn't talk about. What about women? Epitestosterone, so your body makes androstenedione, dione, and then it's just a left and right split, right? Essentially, conceptually, half of it goes to testosterone, and that's active. Half of it goes to epitestosterone, and it's just hanging out. It doesn't really seem to have much of an impact, although maybe there's more to discover. Who knows? But that's the story, right? So in a man, that's testicular production. That's interesting. In a woman, where's it coming from? Well, the ovaries can make both. Okay, your ovaries shut down. What's left? Well, your adrenals make DHEA, make androstenedione. dione. Boom, you're going to get some testosterone, some epitestosterone from that. So the literature isn't as clear, or my understanding at least isn't as clear, of how to interpret that. But what we do know is the UGT variant is just as relevant for women. So if you have an Asian woman doing a urine test and she has low testosterone, I'd put zero stock in that, right? I might look at the epitestosterone to say, oh, this is going to give me an idea. What else would I look at? 5-alpha androstenediol. diol. Those are your two androgens that remain solid when that variant exists, right? So am I going to base her TRT on that? No. But is it going to give me an idea of how we're doing on that front? Absolutely, right? Okay, very low or high creatinine, just like we showed on that one example, right? When a particular sample has a very high or a very low creatinine, the language I would use is that the cortisol value from that individual sample has more uncertainty, right? Creatinine's ability to correct for hydration is weakened somewhat. So the result might flare up a little bit or it might be under um, reported in terms of where that number actually comes out, okay? Ratio analysis, okay? At very low concentrations, okay, we went through that. Don't put a lot of stock on ratios. Right, you're 216, you're 2416. I really like looking at all three, which is why we have that pie chart. But as you get down to those really, really low levels, start to think of that in more approximate terms. Right. Okay. When else to be careful with interpretation? So that this creatinine correction, you know, when the results are either artificially elevated or artificially low because the creatinine is not as it should be, how do I know? Well, if you had a, a 24 hour urine creatinine, and a range, you could you could get some idea, but mostly this is just like remaining uncertainty. Again, like I said, with a 24-hour urine, you don't know if the patient collected um, the entire 24 hours. You don't know if they measured it right. There's some uncertainty built into that, and that's true here as well. But what's the big thing? And this is true in every case, in any situation, with any lab test. If the clinical picture and the labs don't match, slow your thinking, right? Maybe there's more to the picture that you need to consider. Um, and this is why we have such a wonderful team. Dr. Jones and Dr. Rice have built a team of nine or 10 uh, doctors that use this in their practice. They really know it well. Um, and they have no problem telling you when something doesn't actually match up. But well, a lot of times what you'll get when you do your free clinical consults with them is some extra insight to say, aha, you know, did you realize like the cortisol is low here, but they're on an inhalant. Did you know that can suppress your, your cortisol production or they're, you know, those types of, of things that maybe aren't on the front of your mind, they might be able to give you some insight to. Um, and if it comes to it and we just need to recollect for a patient because something's not making sense with the clinical picture, you know, call and, and set up a clinical consult because they do a wonderful job of helping people to understand what's going on with the labs and working through some of these issues. So um, I thank you very much for your attention. I know we got into the weeds on some of this. Um, some of you may want to watch this again, either to help induce sleep or possibly because you find that you need to understand um, at a little bit higher level um, some of these issues that, you know, if you do the Dutch test a thousand times, uh, you're going to find e each of these issues that creep into your interpretation. And we want you to leverage that information um, as best as possible. So uh, thank you for your time. And I know we had some questions. I think Amy was collecting those. So I'm going to allow her to sneak in here now. Um, and fire away with any questions that we've had. So maybe we can clarify some of these things a little further. 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Mark. I've got a couple questions around creatin um, okay. that are, are a little are a little bit similar. Um, one is asking if exercises changes the amount of creatin in the urine. Okay, so so remember that creatinine is correcting for hydration. So if I go work out crazy hard, but I'm going to get more dehydrated, now my urine sample is just more concentrated. So per volume, you know, it's going to be more yellow. It's going to have more creatinine in it, and uh, I mean per volume. But that's that's also true of the hormone, and that's the point, right? Is that exercising? Let's put it this way: doesn't screw up the test. It allows creatinine to do its thing. Right, so that is well within the bounds of the test to work well, but it is true that a more concentrated urine sample from a state of dehydration is gonna have a higher creatinine value, which is milligrams per milliliter for us. Okay, and this is somewhat similar about, it, do we recommend not to work out on the day prior to sample collection because of the creatinine? So, you know, the creatinine correction when you're working out, um, should work properly. Okay, so then you get into the question of like, what do I want to work out? Well, what what state do I want to find myself in? So I don't think working out, I mean, I would never run a marathon the day before the test, right? Because that's going to, you got this inflammatory state and it's going to change your hormones. Because the question we're always trying to ask is what do you look like in, like, what do you look like, right? So if you modestly exercise every day, uh, you know, and you want to see what you look like in your normal patterns, I think that's fine. Um, I would probably avoid overly strenuous exercise, maybe the day before and the day of test. Um, and then, you know, we've got that morning sample. I don't think exercising is something that we want to standardize over those first two hours that's right in between your two urine collections. Because obviously, you know, your cortisol and all of that um, can can respond to that. But all that to say, the testing will still work fine. Uh, the question is, you know, what do you what do you want to see? Those are the same questions we get on like hormones. Should I stay on my hormones? Well, it's like, well, what do you want to know? If I want to know what my baseline levels of estrogen are, then yeah, I got to get off hormones. If I want to know what I look like in light of my estrogen replacement therapy, then I'm going to go to my little matrix and say, okay, does the Dutch test work well for transdermal estrogen? Absolutely. Okay. So then let's stay on it and let's see what it looks like. Depends on what question you're trying to ask. And I think I've veered off from answering the actual, actual question. So I'll let you bring the next one. Okay, great. So, um, and I know this sort of has a variable answer, I, I believe. Um, what would you recommend for monitoring women on HRT progesterone only? first question for sure is how are you taking it yeah. right so right. if it's oral i would want feedback from the dutch test because it's going to show me information that's useful now i will say progesterone is the easiest thing to take and not monitor because the monitoring is i mean let's say you take vaginal progesterone again like i said in the lecture there isn't a lab that tells you how much progesterone is in the uterus because it's a unique situation so if you're taking estrogen and your only goal is to balance the estrogenic effect in the uterus, lab testing is not going to help you. Um, so if you're on oral, you're going to get good feedback. If you're on transdermal, I don't think there is good feedback to have. So what does the urine tell you with transdermal progesterone? It basically tells you your baseline level plus a little bit. So it'll shift your levels up a little bit. You don't want a dose to that. You're going to be using crazy high doses before you're going to get the urine into levels that you think you'll achieve. Um, with vaginal, I consider progesterone metabolites in urine to be an a slight underestimation of what's going on systemically serum is better for that and probably a gross underestimation of what's going on in the uterus and that's also true of serum testing that nothing speaks for the uterus in that situation sublingual i don't think there's any test that speaks well for sublingual um, if you happen to do progesterone injections for some reason i think any test could probably work well so Okay, let's stay a little bit on the HRT subject matter, um, and if you can expand a little bit more on the accuracy of Dutch tests for other topical uh, preparations, HRT topical preparations. Sure. Okay, so um, we're just actually finishing up some position papers on this. They're, they're really helpful. Um, if we're talking about... Hey, Mark, I think you froze. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? I'm going to try turning off my webcam in case it's... Uh, there you go. Affecting yeah, my yeah. speed here. Okay. Um, okay. So we're talking about 
Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> well, that? the question the question expands a little bit more on the same subject matter of um, hormone replacement therapy and Dutch testing, but it uh, let's if you want to expand the conversation oh. a little bit on other topical right. preparations such as um, yeah. E two. Sure. Um, the I'm gonna I'm just gonna open up my. I think this is helpful to actually yep. see this. Agree. Okay. So um, I'll leave it small like that, but I think you can see it well enough. So this is my asking this question over 10 years. It's changed a little bit over time as we've really dug through the data. So transdermal would be, actually, I'm going to put it in presentation mode because I love me a highlighter. All right. So patches, that's transdermal. Transdermal estrogen here means creams and gels, and then transdermal testosterone. Right. So I said no, no to progesterone. Okay. Everything else... I think what you see in urine works well. So if I start with patches, serum is great for patches. Urine is great also, especially since you get the metabolites. Perfect. Transdermal estrogen, I like urine more than serum because you get what? You get an up and down pattern, especially with the creams. That's hard to time with serum. And the urine is going to be a measurement over time. But otherwise, it tracks pretty well with what's going on in serum, at least with the gels. Uh, there's no cream data for serum really at all. Um, and it also tracks, and this is super important, with the clinical impact. So when you look at the studies and say, well, when did we get increased bone mineral density? When did we get hot flashes to go away? When did we get vaginal dryness, um, vaginal atrophy improved? It's at the level at which the urine value gets out of the postmenopausal range and is driven towards the premenopausal range. I don't think it needs to be in the premenopausal range, but that change in hormone in the Dutch test on transdermal estrogen of any type, I think super meaningful, worth following along with the metabolites. Transdermal testosterone follows a similar pattern with serum, but if you re-listen to the, the second half of my lecture, you'd probably say, you know what, I still want a testosterone to kind of hang my hat on when it comes to transdermal testosterone, knowing that again, the serum is gonna have a little bit of an up and down pattern, the urine gonna, is gonna average that out, but the urine has this caveat of, you know, not necessarily knowing whether someone's going to have proper phase two metabolism. So as you dig into the patterns, you can get an idea of that. Um, but I, I think it's useful in that situation, but I think it's fantastic for transdermal estrogen and patches. Um, and again, you can get numbers for transdermal progesterone. I would not alter a dose based on that number. Okay, great. So I think this is a fun question. Um, with estrogen metabolites, what's more important, the numerical value and if within range or the percentage on the pie chart? If percentage is too high of a metabolite, such as 4-OH, but the value is within green. Well, so that might be a fun one to go into. You are correct in that that is a good question. Um, yeah. Let me find where in the world did that go? Oh, it was clear up at the beginning. Okay, so as we're talking about this, right? Um, a kind of all of the above, um, and it depends on where you find your. Like, if, when you look at this example I gave, it's pretty obvious no matter what you stare at or how you think about it that the 4 hydroxy is elevated relative to the others, whether you're just looking at the absolute numbers because it's the only one that's high, or you're looking at the pie chart, it's out of range, right? So let's say you put a woman like this on dim. Right. So a lot of times with DIM, it'll increase two hydroxylation, but sometimes it also increases four hydroxylation. So if if I put you on DIM, let's say your estrogens are just generally high, I put you on DIM. When you're done, the two hydroxy is sky high. The four hydroxy is a little high. Right. So now I'm looking at the ratios and going, okay, I'm winning the ratio battle here. I feel good about that. I think that's relevant. Right. But still, there's an excess of 4 hydroxy. What does that mean? I tell you that there is, um, there's, that's not been studied to like every detailed level in the literature. And you might mute yourself, maybe I can hear you typing. Um, but you might, you know, you, so you want to look at both. I, I mean, to me, I think the absolute levels are absolutely important. So if you, um, if you're outside of range on a 4 hydroxy estrogen, then I think you have two things. I mean, one, you probably have too much estrogen, 
right? I mean, if you have enough estrogen that you're able to lift the 4-hydroxy clear out of the premenopausal range, regardless of your ratios, you're probably going to want to deal with that. And that's where, okay, maybe DIM will help. But if DIM pushes the 4-hydroxy up too, which it does maybe a third of the time, uh, then maybe think about things like calcium deglucurate. Calcium deglucurate doesn't shift metabolism. It's going to lower your overall estrogen metabolism, right? Or metabolism, I'm sorry, your overall estrogen burden by helping you get rid of it, right? So, so I guess I would say all of those are important, particularly if you're out of range high. Once everything's in range, then I really am looking at those ratios a little bit more. And then as I said, you know, during the lecture, as I get really close to the um, the bottom end of the postmenopausal range. Now I'm not looking at those ratios as much um, anymore, and I'm really looking at that mo as more approximate. So I don't know if that answers the question entirely, but um, I, I think you really want to look at all of those things kind of in concert to see what the whole estrogen story is. You know, what are my parent estrogens? How do the metabolites look relative to those parent estrogens? Because that's kind of your general phase one, let's say, rate. And then you want to look at phase one relative rate. Like in this example, man, you're making a lot of 4-hydroxy estrogens. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Great. So um, I think you might have an example of this on one of your slides. Um, and I think this is what this question is referring to. Um, you know, when we do the progesterone uh, uh, serum equivalent, um, yes. I'm being asked if that's a fairly accurate for topical progesterone, which I know you've somewhat answered. I don't know if you just want to kind of readdress this. So when you're looking at, um, let me go ahead and just find an example. Okay, so the progesterone serum equivalent, it gives you a good idea of where the serum sits, right? Um, when you take transdermal progesterone, you don't expect serum to go up much and you don't expect urine to go up much. My experience has been that the urine goes up a little bit more than the serum. Um, so I don't know how well that would correlate. Like to see this result here, 7.3. If you want to push a woman to 7.3 in serum, you're probably using, for postmenopausal, you're probably using like hundreds of milligrams of progesterone, right? And I think to get up into the, what I've shown is that you don't get into the luteal range on average, as this woman is barely with even 200 milligrams. So I would say they parallel each other, let's say approximately. I think that's probably a fair way to um, to look at that. But the thing is, I don't think either value means a thing, right? What it means is, uh, if, okay, let's say this woman right here, you said, well, she's on 50 milligrams of progesterone. What does that mean? Well, that number right there would probably be like 6.2, 6.5. And then it pushed up a little bit more because you're taking 50 milligrams. So then you say, well, is the dose right? And I would just say, I have no idea. I have no idea. Transdermal progesterone has not been proven to balance estrogen when you're on ERT. I don't think you should use it to balance estrogen. You cannot show. There's one study that says it works, two studies that say it doesn't, and there's just not enough data, right? So I, I think if you're in a premenopausal, let's say this is a premenopausal woman, she's got estrogen dominance. The progesterone's hanging in there. By all means, like if a little transdermal progesterone makes her feel better, helps her estrogen dominance, awesome. But the number you're going to get on our test is still going to tell you, A, am I ovulating? If you're in the luteal range, you're probably ovulating, right? And then how strong that ovulation is, right? So if this is 7.3, it's weak, whether you're on topical progesterone or not. If it's 17.3, then it's strong, right? And most of that's not from the topical progesterone, you know? So that would be my, I can th think the way I would approach that. Okay. So uh, this is going to be our last question. Um... So the audience member said a faculty member at IFM uh, stated that he does not test sex hormones in perimenopausal women since they can be all over the place. Okay. Um, yet he has a has an OBGYN colleague that does test in this population. Um, do we feel there's any limitation that the Dutch test would have with a perimenopausal woman? Okay, so really good question. Um... And this is going to depend a little bit on people's sort of philosophical approach to this. But, you know, we talked about the issue of uncertainty, right? And I think with perimenopausal women, you have an additional level of uncertainty as it relates to hormone levels that change a lot. Now, if they change throughout the day, urine test, Dutch test the rescue, right? Because it's going to average that out and that's better. But it is also going to wave around a little bit from Monday to Tuesday, more so, I think, than at other 
um, stages of life, right? So, um, so I think in that sense, it can there can be a little bit of uncertainty there, and that's where I, I would say to me the testing has value for sure, um, and you're going to get feedback that's going to be helpful. But I would say in my mind, I'm introducing a little bit more uncertainty as to how stable those values are. Now, if you said, you know what, though, I really care and I've got a few more dollars, then I would do a cycle mapping test because then you're going to get like throughout the cycle. And so if the estrogen's flying all over the place from day to day, you'll see that. But you'll also see, you know, generally what bounds it is within, right? Are the ovaries still making estrogen? You can ask that question. Are the ovaries making too much estrogen on at certain times? You can ask that question. Did I ovulate? That's a tough question sometimes when you have really irregular cycles and levels. Um, and so the cycle map can be an option there. And it depends on how uh, how much you care about what those levels look like over the course of, of a woman's cycle. I find the information very useful. But I think I don't think it's overly cynical to say there's too much uncertainty here, and I'm I'm not going to test. Like that's an option you can take. I personally I think you make better decisions when you have a lab test. I, it is one of those situations where I would prefer the Dutch test because I'm getting all of those hormones, not just estradiol, getting the whole family of hormones, okay? But I'm also getting it over a 24 hour period of time, which to me brings a lot more stability to figuring out where you are in that transition because i really want to know i mean especially as we start to look at you know things like uh estrogen replacement therapy and and breast cancer risks and and things like that of those relationships that that understanding as much as you can about your patient and where they are in that transition um i, I think is pretty important information but again there is a higher level of uncertainty uh, when you're in that phase of life and you need to interpret in light of that Okay, that's going to be our last question. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. This was informative. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. All right. Bye, everyone. Uh, please remember to join us in October. Uh, we'll have a webinar with Dr. Tara Scott on estrogen metabolism and breast cancer. Look for that on October 14th, and uh, we'll be sending some promotion on that. Thanks again, everyone.